Thank you. Good afternoon and a warm welcome um, to the session around the theme of emergence of purposeful philanthropy. We are joined by a very eminent panel comprising <laughs> comprising <laughs> Am I audible? Yes. OK, thank you. Sorry about that. Good afternoon again, and a warm welcome to the session around the theme of emergence of purposeful philanthropy. We are joined by an eminent panel comprising both philanthropists and grantees. The moderator for the session is Mr. Sitaraman Shankar. Mr. Shankar, I'd like to briefly introduce you before uh, requesting you to introduce the panelists and moderate the session. Sure. We'd also like to thank the Deccan Herald for being our media partners for the session. Uh, Mr. Sita Raman Shankar is the CEO of Printers Mysore Private Limited. He is also the editor of the Deccan Herald. In the 25 years that he has spent in journalism, Mr. Shankar has accumulated a wide range of experiences in developing uh, emerging uh, and frontier markets across various disciplines, be it reporting, feature writing, editing, news editing, and managing and working at India's Economic Times and then Reuters in Mumbai, Frankfurt, London, and Dubai. Other locations he has reported out of include Moscow, Vienna, and Singapore. He returned to India in July 2012 to take on a senior role at the Hindustan Times, where he oversaw its largest edition, ran coverage of the 2014 elections, and trained nearly 100 colleagues at Network 18, which he joined in August of 2016, he led a revamp of India's largest financial site, Money Control, giving it a news focus and hiring over 50 journalists to set up a newsroom. Thank you all very much for being here this afternoon. Mr. Shankar, over to you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, Natina. So I'll, um, we have a wonderful panel today. So I'll uh, run, spend a quick minute introducing them. Uh, not that they require too much introduction, but uh, let me start with uh, Ms. Amit Chandra, who is Managing Director and Chairman of uh, Paint uh, Capital Private Equity, member of the Financial and Business uh, Services Vertical, and member of the Asia Pacific Leadership Team. Uh, prior to Bain, he was for a long time at DSP Merrill Lynch. Uh, and then uh, he started off at, um, prior to his MBA, he was at Larson and Cooper. So long and distinguished career as a philanthropist, and of course, as a, a financial reserve. Orgo Sengupta is a founder and research director at Vidhi Center of Legal Policies, areas of specialization in constitutional law and regulation of the digital economy. Has served on a number of government committees, including the BN Krishna Led Committee on Experts uh, on, a, on Data Protection Framework for India. Um, his most recently authored book is The Independence and Accountability of the Indian Higher Judiciary, which builds on his doctoral work at Oxford. Uh, Ms. Anuaga, uh, Anuaga will be joining us very soon on an audio link is a billionaire businesswoman and social worker who's led Thermax, an energy and environment engineering business, as a chairperson from 1996 to 2004. Uh, she is currently board member of uh, Teach for India. And of course, Ms. Shaheen Mistri is uh, CEO of Teach for India. Uh, Shaheen launched Teach for India in 2008. And since then, the organization has recruited, trained, and placed nearly 1,700 fellows in schools across seven cities. So welcome to all of you. It's wonderful having such a distinguished panel. I think it would be a great learning experience for me, and I think that we should be able to get some very interesting insights uh, from the next half an hour or so. So um, the way we see this uh, working out is in the next half an hour, um, give or take five minutes, we'll try and piece together what builds a successful relationship uh, between a funder and a fundee or a grantee. Uh, what, what sort of partnership evolves? I mean, how, how it gets stronger and stronger? What are the challenges in it? What are the major stumbling blocks that you need to overcome? And how do you resolve conflict? How does it, uh, when, when you do hit these occasional roadblocks, how do you uh, overcome them? How do you uh, get around them if you want? What, what does each look for in each other? And uh, uh, if we have a little bit of extra time, we'll, I think we have an hour, we'll uh, look at uh, some specific questions for the panelists, each of whom comes with a, uh, with a very strong background in uh, philanthropy. So let me start, I think, uh, do we have Anu yet, or should we just uh, give it? I think we should get underway. Should we? Or yeah, I think there are, there is an audience. So let's let let me uh, 
start off with a very basic question for the funders and the fundees. So what does an organization look for in a funder? Let me go to Shaheen and Orgo first. And Shaheen, maybe you can lead off on this one. Such a nice question. And so 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 nice to be here um, with all of you. I, I think, um, you know, in an ideal world, you look for someone who shares a similar vision for what the organization wants to change. Um, I think if that is solid, if there's really alignment that like, here is what we really want to shift together, even if there are differences in how to get there, you can work through them. So I think to me, that's the most fundamental. If I were to add a little bit to that, I would say a level of trust, um, the ability to make mistakes on both sides and work together um, despite that. Um, and and a, a feeling of partnership. I think often when money is in, involved, there is a power dynamic and, and that is difficult. Um, so however much a funder can truly make you feel like this is a partnership, we're bringing different things of equal value to it. Wonderful, that's nice and crisp and I think it gives us a really good idea. So Olgo, do you want to take it from there? Yeah, I think Shaheen's pretty much said what had to be said. Uh, I'll just add a couple of things in terms of what I think an early stage entrepreneur really looks at. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think if we unpack this idea of what is a partner, I think this is pretty much hitting the nail on the head. Because I think what an early stage entrepreneur looks for, and certainly I look for uh, when we were starting out, as in is essentially a person who not only funds, but a person with whom you can have an honest relationship and you can talk to them about things you've achieved and you talk to them about things that you haven't achieved. And I think it's very critical to understand that this is not a relationship where you have to say that this is 10 on 10 on everything okay? because then pretty much that's that's a relationship that's based on dishonesty. So I think if you were to unpack this idea of partnership, I would say that the first element which as an early stage entrepreneur I look for is, is someone who I could be perfectly honest with bounce ideas of talk about successes as well as talk about failures and how we can do that and i think that's the first and the second and, and i think this is something that uh, you know we often shy away from this but i think it's got to be said that right at the beginning as in what someone like me look for is really organizational support in terms of funding Okay, I think this is very critical that a lot of funders are interested in particular program areas uh, and that's great. And if there is an alignment, they're super, nothing better. But what I think uh, in the early stage, I'm thinking back to 2013, 14, 15, what we really look for is people who could provide capacity building support because the organization has to pay salaries. It has to do all the non-sexy stuff of ensuring that rent is paid and so on. And, and it's difficult to actually get funders who understand that because it's not something that is that is sort of immediately you know putting food in someone's mouth or is actually teaching arithmetic to something so you know it's a, so i think at the early stage organizations do require capacity building funding and gentle conversations and a lot of honesty okay so from shaheen and you i'm hearing uh, the need for honesty need for trust between funder and fundy uh, feeling of partnership, uh, easy power dynamic, a partnership of equals. Uh, and of course, you mentioned um, someone you can be honest with and comfortable with. I think that kind of chimes with what Shaheen is saying. Uh, it's an easy relationship. And of course, you mentioned this business about uh, the, 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 humdrum, the humdrum, but very important stuff that needs funding. And you want an understanding from your funder of that. Uh, I think that's an important point. Um, I don't think Anu is here yet, but uh, Amit, can we switch this to the, the funder side? Uh, what what do you look for in an organization that you're going to fund? Uh, thank you, Shankar. Um, you know, Shankar, I do think uh, what we look for today uh, is uh, is not a static view. It has evolved a lot over the last uh, you know decade or two uh, that we've been involved with the social sector. Um, and I think a lot of what uh, both Shah Shaheen and Argyo said uh, resonated with me. Um, I think first and foremost, um, our view has changed from looking at uh, organizations uh, as NGOs to being developmental partners. 
uh, I don't think we, we, we don't use the word NGOs anymore. We use the word developmental partners when we look at them. And the reason we use that term is because effectively every organization we work with is really helping us realize uh, the dream of what we want to see in the world around us. Uh, I, so I think the first thing we really look for in every organization we work with is do we think that working with them, you know, we can together uh, realize the the dreams that we uh, that we aspire for. Um, I think the there are a number of other things uh, that that both of them touched upon that I think are very important uh, because the word partnership in that term is very important to us. Uh, the honesty in the relationship becomes very important. I think we are absolutely fine hearing uh, good good news from in terms of just emails and updates uh, here, uh, you know, from the market. But I think uh, it's very important for us to hear about things that go wrong firsthand. Um, I think that's that honesty in that relationship is uh, is very important to us. Um, when we start the relationship, I think it's very important for us to assess uh, commitment and perseverance. I think that becomes less important uh, over time once the relationship gets established. Um, I think because of the point we are at today, um, I think it it because we are really trying to uh, make systemic impact, it's very important for us to assess what the theory of change is and whether the organization is really capable of delivering systemic impact and whether it has um, uh, inbuilt mechanism to both uh, you know share knowledge uh, openly and to advocate uh, you know uh, advocate uh, how it is basically uh, you know what it is learning and how it is going to impact uh, systems also its ability to kind of you know drive partnerships so i think some of those things to us are uh, are really really important thank you Amit. so now let's let's uh, look at this as a funder fundy pair uh, unfortunately Shaheen, i think uh, we'll have to step away a bit but let's look at Ogo and uh, Amit. so what what do you, what's the relationship like and how has it survived the down moments? I presume there have been some, uh, all relationships have down moments. But would you say that you've achieved the best version of what you can do together? What what remains to be done? I'm sure again, there's a long way ahead. But can you dilate a bit on that? Um, Orgo, you want to take that? Yeah, I think uh, everything remains to be done. I think mm -hmm. if you just look at the, I think what we work on at JD is writing better laws for India. And I think there is a long, long way to go. And I don't think this race does have a finishing line, right? So I think there is a, we're just kind of starting on this journey. But I was actually, when this question was put to me earlier as in one of the dry runs, as in I actually looked back to uh, what, I mean, just thinking back to the first time I, I did meet him. And, and he had asked me a question, which was, why do you do what you do? And I still remember this very clearly. It's a very simple question. And I and I had a I had a ready spiel, you know, because I wanted money, so I had a ready spiel as to what I do. But that's the first time I said that, you know, what we do is we write better laws for India, and that was really uh, what I thought captured our mission very very succinctly. Um, and over time, and I think what has happened, and this is testimony to what you said in terms of how the relationship survives. I think it survives and flourishes because of two clear reasons. One is the fact that I, what I get from uh, Amit is always a new insight, a new way of looking at things. We come from different backgrounds and, and I think uh, as, as someone had told me when I was trying to start with him, he said that, oh, you won't be able to start it. Lawyers are not entrepreneurs. Lawyers are like shopkeepers. You know, so because we run kind of small shops of five, seven people each. Okay, so the fact is that it was so. What I get from Amit all the time is an insight into the way in which we look at things. And I'll give you one example, and I'll stop there because I think that that captures it better than uh, me rambling on on other things. Is that very early on we did a project in relation to drug abuse in Punjab. We know that the drug problem in Punjab has gone through the roof, and it's a whole generation that's getting wiped out because of of addiction issues. And we wanted to study it to see what's happening. There is a criminal law in place, the NTPS Act, which says all this, prescribes all these punishments. But why is it that things are not coming down? And uh, and we did this really fancy report. We got a lot of traction, a lot of people saying things. Uh, 
But the fact is, and we got a lot of, uh, and we got a lot of uh, media traction on that as well. I think Amit said one thing which I remember is the fact that maybe you should do another version of this for the common person. This is a version for you know the people, the, the intelligentsia, yeah, and that's great because that's necessary. But this change will not happen overnight. This change on if we were to look at drugs not as a criminal law issue but as a public health issue, this will take time. And so I think this was a tremendous insight because this is something that we do did not only with drugs but with but with everything across later. And 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 I think this is really what uh, the strength of that relationship has been, which is that uh, the ability to get insights into from from a very different perspective. And I'll leave Amit to talk about the downsides. <laughs> okay, but before we before we go there, I mean, uh, before you met Amit and this relationship, this funding relationship started, you must have gone elsewhere, or did you not, in in search of funding? Now, yes, where did where did some of those conversations fall down? Yeah, I think that I think see, there's there's one thing that I we, we must realize, and and you know, I, I know that in Charcha there are a whole ray, ray universe of entrepreneurs who are here, but there is a larger universe of entrepreneurs who are not. Here. Okay, and the fact is that I think I find myself to be fortunate. As in, I was when I wanted to start Vidhi, I was a lecturer in law at Oxford University, and this was very easy to open door. Okay, and I realized that people don't have these networks. Uh, and even for me, it took a while because I, whatever, my networks weren't sort of in the world of business or philanthropy. But it took a while. So I think uh, the first thing that 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 we must realize is that. There is a lot of perseverance that takes place right at the outset because there are very few funders who back an idea. There are a lot of funders who back something that's running, but very few back an idea. Number one. Number two is that I think it's really, really critical on those days. And I remember I used to live in Kandivli, and I used to go to uh, sort of South Bombay uh, sometimes by train and sometimes by car. Uh, and uh, it was as in most of these days, there were these two and a half hours. I was stuck in traffic. For everyone who knows Bombay, it took me sometimes three hours to go there, and you'd come back at the end of the day saying, "Why the hell am I doing this?" You know, because you're not going to get anything out of this. So there were a lot of these days. So what, second thing is you have to hang in there, and the third thing, which is really something for funders, and and I think this is something that's interesting because I speak to a lot of charities who are who are, who find it much harder than us to raise funding, and I think it's really important for existing funders to at least introduce charities that they support. Uh, development partners to one other person, and I think that's how the network kind of grows. Support is great, but I think everyone needs networks to grow. So it's a long, hard struggle, uh, and 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 I think you just have to stay the course and hang in. Right, Amit. Uh, what's your side of this? It's uh, clearly you fund a lot of people. So you know, uh, Shankar, I'll make two points. Uh, you know, one is when you when you're tackling very difficult uh, problems, uh, unlike in the corporate world where uh, you have you you have line of sight to early results, I think you often uh, need to take uh, a longer, much much more longer term view, um, and I think often people lose sight of that. Uh, so we understand, and I, I've learned this, uh, uh, you know, the hard way. That you, you know, I was much more impatient in the social sector in my first ten years. I can tell you that. Um, so when you find a good, dedicated bunch of people who are dedicating their life to solving difficult issues, I think you got to be humble and uh, give them space. Um, so our engagement with Vidhi, for example, and we have similar engagement with a lot of people, uh, is to invest in in two different ways. One is uh, we do invest in their capacity. Uh, you know, we are not a large, uh, you know, trust like Tata Trust or Azim Premji. We are a small family foundation. So we find that it's very valuable to invest in their capacity. So we've invested in their fundraising capability. We've invested in their communication capability over the years. We find those are high multiplier areas, mm -hmm. which unfortunately other people don't invest in. But if you get it right, you can actually make a big uh, impact on an organization. And I urge funders to give unrestricted grants to organizations in those areas. Uh, and we've now demonstrated by doing this with at least 30 or 40 organizations that if you get that right, 
you can actually materially impact the fortune of uh, organizations that you partner with. The second thing I would say to the point that you made about ups and downs, there are some very difficult areas that Vidhi tackles that we have the privilege of working with them on. My wife and I are very passionate about, uh, you know, trying to do whatever we can on the area of gender violence. Now, we have different ways in which we support organizations. We work with some grassroots organizations in that area. But one of the ways in which we try to uh, approach that is by working with Vidhi on the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And it's a very interesting way, but we know that that's a difficult approach and a difficult lens to take. Now, I can tell you that we have milestones that obviously are set for Vidhi. And I know that Archeo feels terrible every time he reports back to us and says, I have not met those milestones. I know the team that, you know, reports to me feels terrible when they get back and say that Vidhi did not meet those milestones. But this is where our judgment comes in that it's not necessarily their fault that it's an entire ecosystem that you know is engaged with that that of course if they had the ability to deal with things in a perfect world things would move faster and i know that you know there are not many members in their team who would love to move things faster so that we would have a more just uh, system dealing with gender violence and so i think that's where you will need to ex exhibit some degree of, you know, judgment and maturity when you're dealing with difficult issues. So, um, I can see a wonderful face on the screen. Uh, just, just to uh, take you up on that. So, I mean, it depends on, I guess, your comfort level with the with the partner. This judgment on, uh, I mean, you could also take a harder view. If, uh, I suppose people were in the initial stage of their relationship not meeting milestones. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, you and we have that. we have taken a harder view, but we've taken yes. a harder view where we believe that it's warranted that people have, you know, it's because of lack of effort as opposed to intent. Sure. So I think Anu has joined us right right on time. Um, is this is this a is this a message re recording or? Uh, okay, Anu, are you there or? Okay, I think Anu has a message for our session that it's it'll be an audio clip, so it's uh, almost as good as a real thing. But uh, Shaheen, I think over to you. The same question: um, What's the relationship been like uh, with Anu, and how has it survived the down moments? What have you done to get over these few moments that haven't been ideal? Yeah. I mean, firstly, before I get I get to Anu, I have such a long history with Amit, so it's just quite incredible to be uh, on this panel um, with both of you. But you know, the the one insight as I was just listening, uh, as I think both about Amit and Anu, and then I'll I'll go more into the relationship with Anu, is like I've realized the most important thing to me in a relationship with a funder is the human being that that funder is. Um, and I think having had the vantage point of knowing Amit and Anu for a couple of decades now and seeing that evolution, not just professionally, but the way they conduct their personal lives, um, just the role models that they are in terms of the courage to be different. You know, I, I think that's one thing I would say um, both about Amit and Anu that to, to walk the, the less trodden path. Uh, there have been many moments in my relationship with Anu where I've seen her stand up and say things with such honesty. It's almost taken my breath away, you know, and I've said, my gosh, did Anu really say that, you know, but but that level of integrity and humanity um, and willingness to like walk the talk is what I think has been most characteristic about the relationship. And so honestly, much more than the tremendous support to the organization, 
as someone leading the organization through a roller coaster of ups and downs, I think having funders who are such role models as human beings has taught me a lot of not just the skills, but the values, the mindsets, the way of looking at life um, that have been so essential in staying in the work over time. Um, and so that's really the most important thing I wanted to say. I mean, the, the journey with Anu has been absolutely, I mean, I don't know how to describe it in, in words. I'm going back to the first time that I met Anu um, at the Willingdon Club in Mumbai. And she came with pages, I think, at least to me, it seemed like pages of questions about Akanksha, many of them such micro questions that as the head of the organization, I'd never even thought about answers to these questions, you know? Um, and, and you know, Amit is probably smiling because he's been a huge questioner in my life as well. I think one of one of the people that has challenged me absolutely the most in, in through many years of building Akanksha. So I think um, they've played really important roles as being the forces that have challenged my leadership um, and, and given me very, very honest, very direct feedback. Sometimes that feedback has felt a little bit hurtful as well. Um, and there's been some emotion attached to it. And then at the same time, but with an even greater amount, just showered me with like unconditional love and support. And, and to me, it's been that balance of like, and the same person who can really challenge you also like stick their neck out for you when it really matters, be there in the difficult times, through the crises, show that unconditional support, but still almost in the same breath, ask the difficult questions. Um, that's how I would most characterize, I think, my relationship. So again, uh, no, no, well, obviously there's been no insurmountable roadblock, but where was the closest you came to kind of, um, I mean, where did this this conversation get really very difficult? I mean, for anyone, no, I mean, not just Shaheen, but. Um... We have very regular difficult conversations. Uh, as I, mean... I think we've just lost all of you, have we? Just give him a second. cases in relation to rape and domestic violence hmm. are actually heard and disposed of quickly without affecting other cases okay so this is a as you can imagine this is a complicated exercise of intelligent scheduling of cases it involves training and sensitization of judges uh, it involves uh, creating courtrooms which have physical infrastructure that is gender sensitive now this involves the judiciary which has all the right intentions but is a cautious institution of state, much more cautious than others. And we have regular three-month discussions with Amit and his team where there are milestones. And, and as Amit rightly said, these milestones, as we feel terrible, but these milestones are missed quite often. And sometimes they are missed because of someone else, and sometimes they are missed because we didn't try hard enough. As an, and, and I think that sort of makes us feel, feel terrible, as if someone points it out. But I think, and, and as Shaheen was saying this, as in it was resonating, that at that moment, it's very hurtful to hear this, you know. But I think it's extremely essential to hear this because that's what ultimately spurs us to do better. Of course, some things could be someone else's problem, but that's a cop out. As in, what can we do, given the constraints in which we all operate, to ensure that we are doing our hearts? And that's where I think, and this is a sort of slightly different point from what we've been making earlier, is that this professional approach that a new age funder and we Amit is a, I, I would classify him as a new age funder and there are there are several uh, because he's really taken the lead in this. Uh, but this professional approach to philanthropy is really something that makes the sector better, that makes us a better version of ourselves, and I think uh, does away with this tag of the developmental sector being unprofessional. Okay, and I think that's where, uh, and, I, and I do believe that what Amit was saying is very important, that we are not in primarily NGOs. Why should we be determined by what we are not? We are not government. Yeah, we are not government. No one's saying we are government. 
we are part of the development sector and since this is an event of the development sector i thought this is a good opportunity that maybe when i was preparing for this i thought maybe we should call ourselves india.org like we have india inc uh, to call world of business because we need to be seen as a coherent sector that is doing work for the community but is doing it professionally I mean, I was going to ask you what are the sort of performance metrics you monitor, and and at a at a point in time when you have developed a lot of trust, do you just let go? But from what Orgo says, uh, you seem to keep a very beady eye on him and on other fundies. Is that is that the case? Uh, <laughs> you know, that's a uh, very good question, Shankar. I um, I know there's this great uh, debate. Uh, going on right now that you should just completely let go. Yeah. Um, no, I, 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 we don't. We don't completely let go. I think we don't uh, let go because we we are partners, and you know we want to know what's going on. Um, we want to you know, and so you know, and, and we also believe that uh, to some extent we can contribute uh, to change uh, with some of the knowledge uh, that we have by being. Uh, engaged in a lot of a uh, lot of areas so um we don't completely let go um we do have uh, dashboards by which we monitor uh, things that we are engaged with um but i don't think we are uh, ob obtrusive um so i don't think we you know i i know that there are a lot of uh, donors um, many csr uh, folks in particular who who kind of try to be engaged sometimes you know in a kind of a you know uh, you know unnecessary uh, unnecessarily uh, uh, you know uh, uh, obtrusive manner but, uh, that's not our intent uh, if we we don't try to ask unnecessary questions uh, we want to be informed and where we can contribute we try to contribute sure i think that kind of uh neatly leads in fact you've answered part of it top two to three reasons why a relationship between a funder and a fundy runs the ground what's what's your view on that anu can come in now i think it's just okay yeah. can we just take that question and then move on to anu yeah i, I would say that i mean dishonesty uh you know uh, and as shaheen rightly put it uh, the when trust breaks down i think it's probably the biggest reason uh why you know why why things actually go uh, go aground i would say that's pr probably the you know the 8020 of uh, of the problem um you know i think uh, everything else in my mind is trivial right so i think uh, comfort level trust um, mutual understanding i think is something which we've been hearing through the last 30 30 odd minutes i think that's, uh, that's an important point i think uh, that's where it all seems to get built or broken uh, anu I, uh, nice to have you uh, with us um, is this a is this anu live or anu on recording can we can we hear? Uh, i'm sorry i cannot be with you today and i'll do my best what is my relationship with chahi when i met chahi the first time in mumbai about 25 years ago I was full of admiration for a passion to this love for kids. Now he was 18 when he came to India, having studied, having lived abroad, and the kids who were on the streets, not going to school, really bothered her, and she decided not to go to the U.S. and start a kansha. Her enthusiasm. Rubbed on me. I often tease her about her Western accent. Over time, we've become very good friends, but that does not stop us from giving each other honest and authentic feedback, and the relationship has matured and strengthened. We are there for each other through good and bad times, and I love her and want her to succeed. What is my motivation for giving? My son, who died at 25, wanted substantial amounts of our income to give for social causes. 
after his demise i was looking for a credible ngo and everyone suggested i meet shahi so that was a motivation goes from a distant seems very really glamorous but you soon realize it does not give you satisfaction and you can be get trapped in the rat race and becoming a rat yourself and i certainly didn't want to end up being a rat i strongly believe in gandhi ji trusted model and as i read about it that motivated me and by training i'm a social worker and i knew that basic health and education after 75 years of independence are totally neglected and the amount of money allocated in their budget in the budget is dismal quality of education and health is very poor since i met chahin and was motivated by her work i was keen to support her at akanksha i saw the impact they were having on kids not just academically but values for character and making people good human what are the long term changes i expect to philanthropy to teach for india which is what chahin started after akanksha we are touching the life of almost one in every 10 children through the fellowship alum and alum we are working towards influencing government policy through alums working within the government Shaheen has played a role in framing the new education policy, and for example, there is a lot of uh, talk about opening schools, and we are advocating for it. So we are hoping to long term, the long term education quality of education will dramatically improve for every time in India. How does philanthropy support changes at the individual role and scale? Initially, a startup NGO like TFI relies on philanthropy for funding since it has no APG or SPR. Thereafter, it relies on the donor for strategic input, connections to raise funds, and advocacy. From time in fact, over time. you may want to reduce your funding to that ngo or give it to some other area for example we are talking about giving less to tfi but giving more to the alum what do philanthropists look for in entrepreneurs the most important is credibility trust passion commitment transparency not hiding mistakes creativity ability to grow just writing a check is not at all satisfying for me i like being involved in many different ways and chahin involves the board in many creative ways what is very satisfying is interacting with the kids and i learn a lot from them We often say NGOs can learn from corporates, but I think the way TFI board is run, corporates can learn how to be creative and do no work, but also has fun. How should philanthropists support patients' practice? Causes like governance, education, do not show results overnight. You can see the mark the children get, but you don't see the impact it has made on the education sector. At Akansha, we have defined our vision: not just doing well in exams, but pulling the kids out of poverty, which means investing for the long term. And for that, you need a lot of patience and not expect the results immediately. I'm very sorry once again, and thank you for giving me a chance. 
Thank you. That was wonderful from Anu. Uh, unfortunately, not able to be with us today, but uh, that was a really inspiring message. So she mentioned something about corporates learning from NGOs. Now, Orgo, do you just want to take that? What do you think some of the lessons that uh, it's going the other way, but what are the lessons that uh, corporates can draw from your experience? This is a hard one for me. I think you should ask Amit. I've, ask never, been the, good, yeah. I've never been in the corporate sector. As in I, I, this is something I don't, I don't have an answer to except to say one thing. And uh, I can only go back to uh, perhaps the greatest corporate leader of them all, Jamshed Ji Tata. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, there was an interesting episode where Sorry, there's a lot of rain and thunder here, so there's a little bit of disturbance. But there is a there is an interesting episode where Swami Vivekananda was on a ship when he was going to Chicago. He was uh, on the ship with Jamshed Ji Tata, hmm. and Jamshed Ji Tata told him that his biggest mission in life was to set up India's first postgraduate research university in science, something that he couldn't do uh, for a long period of time. Uh, and Swami Vivekananda, once uh, Jamshed Ji Tata passed away. Swami Vivekananda said that that was the greatest idea that any Indian ever had. Uh, and this came from a man of business. And I think if we look at Jamshed Ji Tata and his writing and the biographies on him, I think what you can see there is that the need for research, the need for understanding new frontiers of knowledge, the need for passion, which is all of what, what is the social sector brought and he's kind of the creator of that in the social sector. That's what made the Tatas who they are today. And it continues to be the case today. So I think I, what I can say looking at and this reading of Jamshed Ji Tata is that the, the, the passion, the belief in an idea and the, the, firm, uh, the firm belief that, uh, that India needs this. This is something that the social sector has and Jamshed Ji Tata channelized it beautifully for not only the Indian Institute of Science Bangalore, which is the leading institution till this date, but also in creating the House of Tatas, which is much more than just the business house. Wonderful. Shaheen, what are some of the ideas that uh, corporates have got from the NGO you run, or the institution you run? I should ask them. I, know. I mean, you should ask that to, uh, to Anu, maybe. Um, I mean, I, I can share one that Nisa, Nisa Godrej is our, our current chair of our, our board. And one of the things that, that she sort of says with, with a big smile is that when we first started talking about love, love is a core value at Teach for India, she would really like wonder if there was something wrong with us. You know, it just, just seemed a little bit off. And she said now she's understood so much the power of that value um to be able to love what you do the people around you yourself um that she very much uses it now in godrej and feels that her whole approach to, to people and the work has shifted so i think that's that's one example but um i think sometimes at least with with ngo boards where um we're a little bit more able to do things that are a little bit creative, a little bit different, bring people a little bit more proximate to the ground. So I think things that have worked have been bringing voices from the ground into board meetings, um, getting the board to engage in ways that a teacher would engage in a classroom, different types of methodology, um, really fun, which I think is a very underrated value, right? Like we understand the need for fun and joy when you're young. We sort of underestimate the value of just fun and joy when you're when you're older uh, as an adult and i think we try to bring a lot of that into our board meetings now at teach for india as well so i would say yeah just the the ability to to live a wider range of values um to blur the personal and professional a little bit um and just to be able to be yourself in a space and and connect at a, at a deep level Wonderful. Um, I actually had a question for Amit, but maybe we should go to the audience first. I think we are up to 45 minutes now. Uh, so can someone help me with surfacing some of the questions? OK, shall I just ask? I think we have a question from uh, Sudeep Kare. 
in terms of the scale of funding, government could be one of the biggest sources. How do funder funding relations with government contrast with that with private entities and foundations? Um, who wants to take that? Yeah, I'll I think that actually, uh, because this question has come up a number of times as to uh, how do you, uh, how should you look at government? I would like to see the government primarily as the, as the biggest change agent in the country. And from my line of work, as in the amount of change that the government can bring uh, is, is unparalleled. And we talk about scale a lot in these discussions, as in the amount of scale that can be brought through a wise implementation of a policy that is rolled out and implemented well is great. So I see government primarily as a change agent. In, in terms of funding relationships with government, as in, I think the there is a it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, because number one, as a new organization, it's something that you can't do usually because it comes with a whole range of compliance requirements, including for CAG audits. I'm just getting it to the brass tacks of it. So it's actually you're going to spend a lot of money on compliance to do that. And number two, there is a there is a real question, uh, and this depends on your relationships, of course, in terms of safeguarding your independence and your autonomy. So you certainly want to safeguard your independence and autonomy at all points of time. I'm not saying this is a government-only problem. It could happen with a with with a private funder as well. But certainly with the government, as in these the 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 sort of the relative fear of a of a lack of autonomy, together with heavy compliance, means that uh, we at least see them primarily as the biggest change agents in the country and not a potential source of serious grant funding. Either of you want to add to that, Shaheen Amit? Uh, yeah, if I could just add, I, I agree with Argyo. Uh, you know, I feel that um, uh, I, I completely agree, first of all, that uh, it is the government's uh, responsibility to be the largest change agent. And in fact, I think the the philanthropic sector, um, you know, supporting uh, the developmental sector, uh, even if it uh, puts in its full might, uh, will not be able to dent, uh, make a dent on our social problems if the government doesn't do its job. But then the question is, what is the role of the philanthropic sector and the um, and the developmental sector? I think the role is to uh, do two things in my mind. One is to better inform uh, government spending. And the second is to make it more accountable. And so I think the important uh, thing is to figure out how to create templates of change, which uh, you know can be easily infused into, into government policies. Often government programs tend to be either very wasteful, um, you know, or uh, they governments never innovate, rarely innovate. So I think it's important for uh, you know organizations to to prove what is what can work uh, and second is to actually advocate so that uh, you know uh, accountability for government spending actually vastly improves and i think that should be the role that uh, you know uh, the not for profit sector and foundations actually go out and play uh, very very actively excellent so shraddha bagwe asks how should someone new to the impact sector connect with funders and build relationships. Uh, Amit, I guess that's for you. Um, we don't do much of uh, early stage. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people who do early stage. We do some early stage. So maybe I'll take a stab at it. Um, look, there are uh, there are obviously one of the things that we do do is we encourage, uh, we, we try to encourage building platforms um like give india uh, is a uh, is an example of that uh you know wherein um uh, wherein you know organizations can access uh funding um and and give india has dramatically scaled up over the years um you know uh, of course uh, you know we are what we are also trying to do is uh, uh you know figure out ways in which uh uh, other platforms, uh, you know, uh, get built. Um, you know, uh, many years ago, we were involved in funding, um, encouraging a platform called Dana Mojo, which is again recently scaled up. Uh, it's got a big grant from 
uh, Rohini Nilantani Philanthropies. It's great to see other platforms come up as well. So there are, uh, plat we are involved in platform creations, which help, uh, you know, early stage uh, entrepreneurs get access to uh, access to funding. Uh, I do think at the at a basic level, the best way for anyone to get funding is to actually approach someone in their ecosystem uh, and convince them because that's where most journeys typically begin. Um, you know, it's easiest to uh, to really get someone to back you if they if there is one degree of separation. Um, and I would say for anyone to really at least uh, convince someone based on, you know, some degree of familiarity is probably the best way to begin that journey before you really get onto a platform. So you have a track record of having lent to underserved uh, areas, uh, to funding unproven ideas. What makes you do this? And uh, I'm sure a lot of underserved areas are on and what's the phrase unproven ideas out there so just for that benefit what what what's it about you and what's it about your way of thinking that uh, makes you more amenable to this so shankar um it actually came out of a, a strategy project we did uh, many years ago where we said uh, there was a lot of money that was going into we actually looked at a pie chart of where of you know money was going and we discovered that even though uh, there was uh, obviously a lot of need uh, for funding in health and edu and education, we realized that there were areas which were completely underfunded, uh, despite the fact that uh, the needs were enormous. Um, and so we, Archana and I, asked ourselves the question as to you know while the needs there are uh, enormous, who's going to actually step in and uh, and meet some of these needs. And so we decided to uh, focus uh, disproportionately on two of those uh, needs. Uh, one was rural development, which is working with farmers. Um, and the other is capacity building, uh, which by which we could touch a lot of causes. We also decided to focus on a few other uh, things very selectively. Uh, gender violence was one, urban governance was the other. Um, We've also, uh, through capacity building, focused on other underserved areas. I mean, one of our oldest associations has been Olympic Gold Quest. Uh, you know, we, I remember, uh, started, uh, you know, backing Olympic Gold Quest just around the time when uh, Virain joined them as a CEO. Um, and uh, it's wonderful to see now that half our uh, Olympic medals are won, uh, which are won, are won by athletes backed by them. Um, and again, it was basically because no one was really investing in uh, uh, in sports at that point of time. So uh, we do like the notion of basically why are our capacity building vertical choosing things that nobody is really focusing on, but doing that through the capacity building uh, route. Sure. A uh, couple of questions have just popped up. Uh, Joju Vergis has, uh, how, how are funders looking towards sustainability and development organizations how is sustainability defined in the social development sectors so i think there's a preponderance of questions to funders as opposed to fundees so amit i think it's you again <laughs> uh, i think you should ask uh, shaheen and argue that look the issue of sustainability is a big big area of concern um we've uh, we've been you know, uh, sponsoring some research uh, in this area. Um, the data is uh, shocking. Um, by the way, it's uh, it's terrible in the West and it's uh, worse in the worst in, in uh, even worse in India. Um, and I would define sustainability as just how much capital uh, and uh, 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 average NGO has in India uh, to be able to live through a crisis. And I think COVID was a uh, uh, you know, an example of that where many of them had to shutter uh, basic programs and in many cases uh, were unable to pay even salaries of uh, employees uh, as a consequence of which we had mass layoffs. Um, you know, um, I do personally believe that with m many of the organizations that we work, um, we, we uh, have an active program where we try to at least make sure that they have somewhere between one to two years of uh, 
expenses uh, in uh, in terms of uh, uh, cash in the bank and that they work with their core donors to get to that. It's a journey. It's not easy to do that, but they need to convince their core donors that that's an very necessary objective that they, their donors need to support. Um, you know, it needs to happen uh, by actually making sure that every um, offering that you have uh, is appropriately costed. Um, and this is a mindset, mind shift change that donors need to understand. Um, you know, and we are trying to basically put out the right uh, research. Uh, we're working with Britspan on something called Pay What It Takes. It's a collective that we have put together with uh, the Gates Foundation, Edelgave, uh, Rohan, uh, the Rohini Nilankani Foundation, and us and a few others, uh, Central Square Foundation, where we're actually uh, trying to convince all the major donors in the country to sign up for this and then put the data out to get them to understand that unless we do this, we will not have a vibrant social sector in the country. Shaheen, uh, it must have been a tough uh, 18 months for the sector in general, um, given COVID. Um, how, how, how do you answer this sustainability question? I mean, so it, it's interesting to hear, um, hear your, your thoughts, Amit, around like what sustainability is. Um, for me, like the, the one to two year piece, as you said, it's, it's even for an older organization, it's a journey and it's really tough to have two years money in the bank and to get donors to understand that. So really heartened to hear about the effort to shift that narrative. But I, I'm also thinking about like, what does it mean over time to lessen your dependency on donors? And are we thinking creatively enough is a question I'm always asking myself around revenue generation without compromising the stakeholders we want to serve, right? So, at, you know, in TFI and Akanksha, we could always move sort of one level of, of, of higher income in terms of the kids we serve and be able to generate revenue. But if we still want to work with um, the poorest children in urban India right now, what is the mechanism to think creatively about sustainability, especially when we know there are pain points in funding? So, for example, programmatic funding feels much easier to get um, than non-program, administrative, unrestricted. So if we could even become sustainable for those pain points, I think it would help a lot. And I'm, I'm wondering if that is a conversation that's happening in the country or potentially needs to happen where we we really think innovatively about what does it mean to lessen our our dependence because i think donors i mean anu mentioned this as well like donors after a certain number of years also feel that there is a risk of over dependence right on a on a single donor but where does that leave an organization that doesn't know how to reduce dependence overall on donors. So I think that's the dilemma to really think through. Super. I think we have time possibly for one more, maybe one and a half more. Uh, what is Parikshit Menon asks, how does one nudge corporates other than the Tata's Bidlas of this world to look at CSR less as a tax stroke compliance and more of a being integral to business? I think this is squarely in your territory, Hamid. How do you nudge? And I was waiting for that word to emerge at some point, nudge. You know, um, I think it goes back to Argyo's uh, point on Jamshedji Tata. Mm. Um, I think it will have to come from within. Um, I mean, Jamshedji Tata uh, is my inspiration uh, as well. Um, he was a trailblazer who did what he did and then Dorabji Tata followed him in doing what he did um, well before things became fashionable even in the West, right? Um, and then for nearly a century, we basically uh, haven't seen uh, anything of that sort happen. Um, even actually very little of it happened in the West, uh, forget in the East. 
so i do believe personally that these things i think have to come from the inside mm-hmm. um you know what suddenly azim premji decided to do it um i do believe uh, you know that it will happen here um but it will happen with probably a new generation of uh entrepreneurs um they will it will happen more e- even more amongst professionals very quietly i think a number of professionals in this country are actually giving more than many of our entrepreneurs and industrialists are giving uh i mean i think probably shaheen and argyo know that um and so i think the change happens from within um you know it's hard to explain always uh what uh, inspires it um but i think uh once it happens it then you know if it reaches a critical mass it becomes a way of life and i i'm actually very bullish about uh philanthropy in india in the next uh you know 5 to 10 years very very bullish because i see us getting to a tipping point and that's a fantastic note on which to end actually we've just tipped over the 1 hour mark so thank you very very much uh, shaheen uh, anu amit and orgyo and uh, napena over to you thank you you're on mute i think thank you very much thank you for a deeply meaningful session around the theme of philanthropy i think i speak on behalf of the audience when i say that it was not just poignant but uh, equally pragmatic um, and i'm sure many of the things that you've spoken about will continue to simmer in our minds well beyond this session um, so thank you mr shankar for moderating the session that we will remember for some time to come thank you all again wish you all a very good day um to the audience in the auditorium we do have other sessions over the course of the day you can go to the reception area and click on the themes you find interesting in order to see the scheduled events we still have another 25 sessions to go uh, today and i do hope that you will continue to attend those as well see you at the plenary this evening at 7 thank you goodbye bye thank you thank you Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks bye.